I want to switch gears a little bit and go to the next. Everyone remembers in 2007, we had ALK described in um, um, uh, adenocarcinoma lung for some Japanese investigators. The uh, initial observation that um, crizotinib, although not really a d defined ALK inhibitor per se, more, more of a good MET inhibitor, maybe not the best ALK inhibitor, but had activity. It um, uh, got approved based upon you know, phase one, phase two, and now we have phase three data against standard chemo in the first, second line. So it's now our standard of care. Uh, however, like EGFR mutations, we understand that resistance develops, uh, typically nine, 10 months into treatment with crizotinib. And Alex, what do we know about crizotinib resistance in this, in this setting of ALK disease? Yeah, so there are two major um, groups of mechanisms of resistance to crizotinib. There are the ALK dominant mechanisms, where the tumor might manifest with acquired ALK amplification or an ALK mutation. However, the profile of these mutations, it's different from what you're seeing with EGFR, where you have 60% emergence of the gatekeeper T790M. The gatekeeper L1196M occurs in a fraction of ALK, but you see a smattering of other different mutations. And then the second group are the patients whose tumors develop non-ALK dependent mechanisms, where they might acquire some dependence on EGFR on KRAS. However, it seems like the majority of that doesn't matter so much if you come in with a second generation drug, because most patients who receive either electinib or sritinib are poised to respond after acquired resistance to crizotinib. So there's, there's much more to learn about um, acquired resistance, but it seems like the majority of patients continue to manifest a, a dependence on ALK after crizotinib. Yeah, so there's not, there's not really a T790M story here in, in this particular subset of patients. Well, so we can talk a little bit then about the mechanism of resistance to the second generation drugs, where you're seeing much more of an emergence of the solvent front mutation G1202R, which is a little nastier to treat. Um, fortunately, there are newer drugs, uh, which we can talk about later, that um, are poised to abrogate that mechanism yeah. of resistance. Yeah. And we, so we have two drugs um, uh, currently approved you know, based on their activity in crizotinib refractory resistant patients, seritinib and electinib. Jared, why don't you tell us your perspective of how these drugs fit in to current practice? Right, so we have efficacy data for both agents following resistance to crizotinib. Um, the PFS on each of these agents is roughly comparable. Um, in my practice, while there are differences um, in mechanisms of, of resistance that are covered by each of these agents, uh, as I think Alex expressed, they're relatively minor, and both, most patients will uh, respond to both agents. Um, so I'm not doing a repeat biopsy to decide between them. In my practice, toxicity has been the major driver of, uh, of my personal choice. And while I consider acirotinib a very reasonable agent in this context, I've been using electinib preferentially just, just for toxicity reasons. Is the, is the, what are your views on dosing with acirotinib in terms of toxicity and, and those sorts of issues? You, you mentioned um, when we were talking about the first generation uh, EGFR inhibitors, the what I would call a biologically effective dose. Um, you know, many drugs get developed at the maximum tolerated dose. That's historically what we've done. But in many of these driver situations, you may not need MTD dosing. Oh, yes. Is there room for lower dose for, for instance, seritinib? Is the toxicity ameliorated when you lower the dose? Or what are your thoughts on, on that? Well, in the absence of a competitor agent, that's probably what I would be doing in my practice. Um, you can probably go even to half dosing and do just fine. I don't have a lot of clinical experience with that. I'll defer to the rest of the panel if anyone Value, does, because yeah, the yeah. availability of electinib, I've just yeah. used that. So there is emerging data that uh, the lower dose, 450 milligrams given with a low-fat meal for a fat inib, is equivalent pharmacokinetically to the 750 dose and is associated Seritinib. with less yeah, toxicity. Yeah, you met Seritinib. Seritinib. You said a fatinib, but, but, you, but you met Seritinib. Seritinib, yeah. yes. <laughs> That's what I meant. Yeah. Yes. Um, we're still discussing ALK. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so there is some data, but you know how much um, um, adoption of Seritinib in this setting with a lower dose um, we will see is a matter of time, I think, because it's new data. So many people have been adopting the dose reductions. 
um, if they didn't have any other choices.